There's a poem in Thailand. It's a translation from a Sanskrit poem about two devas, husband and wife. And to make a very long story short, a curse is placed on them. They have to fall down and become human beings for a while. They'll be in love as human beings as they were as their devas. And they have to be separated three times. And then after the third separation, then they can come back to heaven. In the body of the poem, and it's a long poem. It's this very sad story how they meet on the human realm. They get separated. They go out on an ocean voyage. The ship wrecks. The man sees his wife's body, but then discovers it's not really her body. The devas are playing tricks on him. He finally meets up with her. And they have other adventures. They finally get lost in a jungle at some point. And see, he, <coughs> he sees her being devoured by lions. And he's so upset that he commits suicide. And then she comes along. It turns out it wasn't her, after all. It was just a deva trick. She comes and sees him. She commits suicide. Next thing you know, they're up in heaven laughing about the whole thing. Compare that with Romeo and Juliet, and you get an idea of the difference between the perspective that's provided by thinking about the many times we've been reborn, and the belief that we have only one breath, and there's only one breath we can get very worked up about things. Things are tragic. Things are horrible. Great injustices have been done. But from the Buddhist point of view, a lot of that comes from the fact that we just don't see the whole story. Think about it, he says, we don't have just one universe. There have been many universes. And they tell us how many billions of years the stars in our universe have been around. And we haven't even gone through the whole cycle of this particular universe, and there have been many before us. As the Buddha said, those who can remember past lives back 40 aeons, in other words, 40 universes, have a short memory. His memory extended far beyond that, to the point where he said, trying to find a beginning point for all this. The whole idea of a beginning point is inconceivable, not just unknowable, inconceivable. And we've been around that long. Which means we're way older than the stars, even the oldest galaxies that the new telescope is getting pictures of. We've been around doing this, taking birth, eating this, eating that, finding pleasure here, finding pleasure there, and then dying, and then coming back and taking birth again, again, and again, and again. When you think about this, it's hard to have a tragic view of things. It's more a sense of just a lot of suffering, accomplishing nothing. So the proper response is not a tragic view of the world. It's more sangwega, followed by dispassion. In other words, realizing that you simply don't want to keep on continuing all this cycle that goes nowhere. It goes up and it comes down. People work really hard to develop good qualities of mind, and then they get rewarded. And as they enjoy the rewards, the good qualities of the mind get worn away as they fall back down again. So the proper response is the desire to get out, and not to get worked up about the individual stories, the particulars of our stories. like the story of a tragedy, the story of a, an injustice. There has to be a beginning point, and there's a very strong sense of an end point. But the injustice taken care of, okay, you finally arrive at justice. That's the end point. In a tragedy, someone has great potential, but then it's nipped in the bud, and that's it. End. 
But in the Buddhist view of the universe, there are no beginnings. So in cases of injustice, you can't say, well, who did what first? And whose response was appropriate to what the other person had done, and whose response was not appropriate. Because it's just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And with tragedies, there's no end. You come back and try again. So it's good to adopt this perspective, because it makes it a lot easier to live in the world without a lot of nostalgia, without a lot of attachment. A lot of the issues that seem so big when we take the view of just one lifetime become very small when you think about aeons and aeons of lifetimes. Think about the Buddha as he finally got to the town of Kusinara, where he was going to die. Passed away for his last time, going to total nirvana. Ananda was upset because it was just a little tiny town he called Little Daub and Waddle Town, which means basically that the houses were made out of nothing but bamboo and mud. It'd be better for the Buddha to go to a great city. There, the people would give him a proper send off. The Buddha said, no, this, this little town here used to be a great city as well. And he goes into a long description of the, how great it was. In fact, there's another sutta that goes even a longer description of how great it was. And he happened to be king that time. And in the story, there comes a point where he's about to die. His wife comes to him with tears in her face. She says, please, try to live, try to live. He said, if you really love me, you wouldn't say that. And she says, well, if I really love you. What should I say? See, all fabrications are inconstant. They should be let go. And so he lets go of that. Of course, coming back to this little tiny town, just underlined the fact that all that greatness was destined just to fall away, fall away. So the best course of action is to figure out how do I can get out. So when you find that your thoughts are taking over, that you find them especially interesting or especially gripping, use this perspective as a solvent to make you see that the tragedy, the injustice, whatever, is not such a big issue. There are other more important issues. Do you want to keep on coming back to this sort of thing? Because that's an area where you really have a choice. You suffer sometimes from your past bad karma. You know, and ask yourself, how much longer do you want to be open to the possibility that there's more bad karma? Or are you coming back and forgetting about the dharma? and doing stupid things all over again, because we've done that who, who knows how many times. We learn some dharma, and then we forget, and then we learn it again, we forget it again. They say that in some universes there never is a Buddha. Think how long a period of time that is, a whole universe, no Buddha, to teach the dharma. So it's pretty risky business coming back. So it's good that you adopt this perspective of deep, deep, deep time. It's a shame that so many modern Dharma teachers are abandoning it. Because without this perspective, it's very hard to let go of your thoughts, your ideas of right and wrong, of what's important, what's tragic, what injustices need to be taken care of before you're willing to rest. Instead, you realize the best course of action is to get out. This is why the, the Buddha's course of action was so compassionate, to show us that there is a way out. Because otherwise you stay on in this cycle of back and forth, back and forth. X does something to Y, Y does something back to X, and pulls in Z. 
Everybody gangs up on everyone else. Over what? Things that just slip away, slip away. You have to remember this is not a world to live in, this is a world to pass through. On your way out. That's the best use of your mental energies, that's the best use of your time. <laughs>